Amen. Amen. So I want to welcome you guys to this series this month. We're working on how to study the Bible. And um, it's just, it's been phenomenal. Last Sunday, Dr. Faye gave us 10 reasons why we studied the Bible. Yeah, that's, that's really good. That was good, still is good, will always be good. And today we just want to study how the study of the God's Word connect with our faith. How to build our faith with the study of the Word of God. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Hebrews 11.1 1 is a very popular Bible passage that we read. It says, now faith is an assurance of what we hope for and the certainty, the documentation, the certificate, the authentication of the things that we do not see. I like the way in different versions you see these two words flipped around, assurance and certainty, saying the same thing about what we hope for and what we do not see. In the New Living Translation, it says this. It says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of the things that we cannot see. The evidence of things we cannot see. And I thank God for God's faithfulness. For God's faithfulness. If you look well enough, if you look deep enough, if you look around you, you will see the faithfulness of God. It's all around us, the faithfulness of God. So we know what faith is, and, and our faith sometimes can be intangible, and sometimes it can be a little elusive for us um, to kind of have faith, perpetual faith, stable faith in God. Do you guys hear that echo? All right. And so faith is an evidence of things we cannot see. And it's the reality of things that we hope for. Romans 10, 17 says this. Romans 10, 17 says this. Consequently, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. I like what the New International Version says, and you see the way I am giving you two different versions for the same scripture. This is how you study the Bible, healthy, because the Bible wasn't written in English, right? It was written in Greek and Hebrew. So we have the Bible translated to us in English, and the truth about it is language are not equal. You can, there are certain words in English we do not have in my dialect back home in Calabari, right? There are certain words I would say in Yoruba, an African language, you can, there's no equivalent for it in English. You may join two phrases to give you the same idea, you may make a sentence to give you the same idea, but you just don't have a word for that exact word. Now, English is arguably the richest language in the world, you know why? Because it's evolved over time to get some Latin in it some French in it, you know, some Roman, some all of that. Um, and it's, it's a rich language. But albeit, it doesn't completely show the shades in different words and their meaning. And so it will behoove you to study the word at least from two or three different versions to really get a gist of what the words that were translated into English means. So New International Version says this, Consequently, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. I want to read that again. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Do you see how scripture separates two words there, two messages there? The same word, but separated to two instances. It says that faith is received, is developed, is appreciated in you when you hear the word. When you hear the word. But the word is the logos himself, which is the message. That is the word. That is what builds faith in you. Not the letter. Not the text. Not the translations. That's not what builds faith in you. What builds faith in you is the word himself. 
Scripture says in the book of John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is the Word that builds faith in you. Not the letter. The letter only introduces the Word. So the Word you read in the Bible is the message of the message. The message you read, the gospel you read, what we read, the translations, what we memorize, is a message that points to the message. And that message is Jesus. That message is the word himself. That message is the unchanging word of God. That message is the logos, the light, the word from the very throne of God. That is the message. Every other thing that we do, when we study the word, it points to the message. And so if you are studying the word, and we're going to come to that, and you find that the message you were hearing, the message you were studying, the scripture you're reading, the books you're reading, is in contradiction with the message, the person of Jesus, then you know you're going astray. The message should always align with the message. Every message, every study, every text, every exercise of faith that we do should point to the message. So faith is not gotten by reading the letter. How do we know? There are Bible scholars, people who study the Bible for fun, who do not have faith in God. Because they do not have the message. They have not encountered the message. They have not encountered the word. Even though they know the word. So the way you develop faith is encountering the word himself. But you cannot encounter the word himself if you don't know the word. So if you don't know your word, you can't encounter the word. If you don't know the gospels, you cannot encounter the message. If you don't know your scripture, you cannot know who the word is. This is why we study the word of God. This is why we study God's word. Because we say faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God does not mean that everybody who hears the word of God, or everybody who reads the word, everybody who studies the word, or everybody who sees the word into action, everybody who sees deliverance break out, and everybody who see proof of the word, it doesn't mean that they believe the word because they saw, because they heard. Because they read. Or because somebody preached to them. The word is Christ himself. Believing in Christ himself. And so this is the connection that you have to study your word first to know about the word. But when you know about the word, then the Holy Spirit helps you believe the word. And then faith begins to develop. Faith begins to develop. Sometimes we want to be lazy. We don't want to read the word, yet we want to know the word. And there's a problem with that. And for some people, they want to read the word, but they don't want to know the word. The word is a person. It's not just the text on your Bible. So you have to read the word, which is the letter, and have the spirit activate the word so that you can know the word, know the message, know the one who is the word, Christ himself. Second Timothy, thank you, sir. Thank you for the testimony. Second Timothy 2.15 says this, study and do your best to present yourself to God approved. A workman tested by trial, this is the amplified version. I see those reading the King James Version says, I, saying I don't see that. I don't see that in my version right here. In the version. <laughs> Just speak up the amplified version. You'll find it there. <laughs> Study and do your best to present yourselves to God approved. A workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed. Do you have a reason to be ashamed? Have you studied your word this week? Have you studied your word this month? Have you studied your word this year? 
Okay, you guys have nothing to be ashamed of. But let's, let's we'll, we'll find out. Let's see. Let's see. But it says, a workman tested by trial who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Two key reasons why you study the Bible. You don't study the Bible to feel good about yourself. You don't study the Bible to have quick responses to people. You don't study the Bible so that you can, you can be, you can be the, 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 the smartest person in the room. You study the Bible so you can adequately, efficiently, accurately handle the word, which leads to application, but also so you can skillfully teach. Somebody say skillfully teach the word. The reason we have poor teachers of the word is because we have poor scholars of the word. The reason why we can sit in places and not hear errors just thrown at us is because we don't know the word. When you study the word of God, two things happen. You know how to handle the word of God. What does that mean? You know how to apply the word of God. There are times when you apply the word of God offensively. There are times you apply the word of God defensively. There are times you apply the word to encourage. There are times you apply the word of God to admonish. There are times you apply the word of God to correct. There are times you apply the word of God to chill. Because some of us don't know how to chill. Whoever got a, a sword and cuts tomatoes with it. It's just crazy, right? That's not the application of that. You bring out a kitchen knife to cut tomatoes. I mean, you, can, you, 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 you do something, but you end up breaking something, hurting somebody. Creating a whole mess. And maybe that's what we have. Maybe that's part of the problem. Why we have so many mess, we're, we're doing the work of ministry, but we're doing it in a bloody way. People are getting hurt. Because we're using instruments that are meant to encourage to chastise. The devices that are meant to build people up to pull them down. Maybe we're misappropriating the word of God. Misrepresenting it. So accurately handling the word of truth and skillfully teaching the truth are the two key things that make you approved. I like this. You all, did you all hear that phrase that, say, that said, a workman tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed? What is testing you? What is testing the word you have heard? A lot of things are testing the word you've heard. And sometimes we don't know that it's a test of the word we've heard. Sometimes we, we hear errors and we just believe it. We say, oh, maybe that's their revelation. When God speaks the word to you, there you, it's your responsibility to handle that word correctly. And you're going to have a test and a trial of the word you heard. What approves you as a believer, as a Christian, as a child of God, what approves you as a student of the word is not what word you dance to. It's not what word you jump at. It's not what word you memorized. It's not what word you have pasted on your door. It is not what word you ran around the church to. It is the word that you were tested on. It is the word that you were tried on. It is the word that you passed the test based on. When God speaks the word to you, the enemy comes to steal it. It comes to destroy. Sometimes you memorize the word too good. You wrote down the prophetic word so good, you can't forget it. So he tries to twist it. It tries to misrepresent it. It is the word that you can hold firm to through trials and testing that you are approved for. Tell me what you are approved for, people of God. That you were tested for. That you have put in practice. That is bearing fruit in your life. You don't study the word just to know the word. You don't study the word just to know the word. And if there's a right way of handling the word of God, then there is a wrong way of handling the word of God. The scripture is telling us to rightfully handle the word. It's because 
you can, you run the risk. We all run the risk. Every one of us run the risk of mishandling the word of God. And the devil, Satan, is the chief architect of misrepresenting the word of God. He is the papa misrepresenter. He will represent, you all didn't get what I did there. It's an African thing. That's to tell you how, how great somebody is. It's just, it's too great to just call him Papa. It's the chief misrepresenter. It twists the word of God. It tweaks the word of God. It shakes the word of God. It gives you a verse and it takes out the word. It gives you a chapter and it takes out a verse. It gives you a book and it takes out a chapter. It always misrepresents God's word to us. But the reason we don't know is because we don't study the word of God. We go by faith. You hear your pastor preach a good word. That word was so good. You be reading your notes. Well, your notes ain't in Jesus. Even the word ain't in Jesus. Jesus is the Logos himself. The word should point to Jesus. So stay eating in your word. Stay aware because the enemy is a trickster. Enemy is always, whenever he comes to tempt, when he comes to tempt, he often, often misrepresents God's word to us. Every temptation the enemy brought to Jesus was based on the word of God. No, no, no. Go study your word. And everybody who has any level in God, any stake in God, any growth in God, any maturity in God, your temptation is not coming outside the word. Your temptation is coming from the word. There's a reason Satan didn't come to Jesus and say, yeah, bro, can you just do this? Because, you know, Jesus is too, too good for that. He understood that Jesus, he understood that Jesus is, has matured past the stage of doing anything outside the word. And so he figured if I must get this level of maturity, this person who has attained this level of maturity, the only way is to misrepresent the truth that they know. For some of us, the certain things people tell you like, you know, are you, are you crazy? You know, I ain't going to do that. I'm filled with the word of God. I'm sanctified. Yo, I can't. But once, once that same temptation comes, with the Bible says, when that same temptation comes out of a preacher or a pastor, with one verse before and after, all of a sudden, it's more believable. All of a sudden, you're considering it. The same thing you wouldn't do if it was spoken to you in plain English, because somebody says, and the word says... All of a sudden, you're like, you know what? I, I, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. But Jesus knew better. Jesus knew better. Scripture says in the book of Matthew 3, 16. And a short time before this, Jesus was baptized. And a voice from heaven de declared this. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Watch this. This is not a scripture that was given in the Old Testament. Yet, the enemy caught wind of it immediately. It was released. It didn't need to be in letter. It was spoken and the enemy caught wind of it. That was the basis on which Jesus was tempted. Not on the Old Testament scripture. What am I saying? There are prophetic words that are released over your life that you are careless about. I am telling you there are dreams that God has given you, prophetic words that God has released, things that God has spoken over you that you were careless about because it's not written in letter. And the enemy was there when it was released. He ain't playing. The moment it's released, the enemy took note of it. Some of you don't even write down your prophetic words. The enemy already wrote it down in black and white. You're too cute to write the word of God. You're too smart to write down scriptural revelation. Oh, I, I got that. I've heard that before. But the enemy wrote it down. He wrote it down in, in the New English version. He wrote it down in the... <laughs> Let me stop. Let me stop playing. So Satan heard when God said, This is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. 
The scripture says the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. And yet comes the devil saying, if you are the son of God. Did I hear the word of God right? If you are the son of God. I mean, look at that. Look at the shade in that, in that phrase. And I'm not saying you're not the son of God. But if you are. And this has driven many as pastors, many as believers into trouble. Because the enemy wants you to prove what God already said you are. What, what business do you have proving anything to the devil? If you are the son of God. What did he say? Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus could have said anything. He could have responded anyhow. He could have dealt with the issue. I mean, he could have said, Satan, are you, are you out of your mind? What's up with you? Can I, can I, get, can I get a break? Can I, can I focus on Jesus, on God, the Father? But what did Jesus do? He responded with the word. He responded with the word. And don't tell me Jesus knew the word because it was supernatural. He read the word because he studied. Scripture says, and the boy grew in favor before God and man. He had to grow in the knowledge of the word of God. He had to spend time studying the word of God. When people were leaving the temple back to Jerusalem, he had to spend time in the temple speaking to the priests. Asking questions and conversing about the word of truth. Studying the word of God. Jesus' response was this. And it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Oftentimes we read this. How many of us know where this word is? Where is it written? Oh, no, no, no. I want real answers. I ain't preaching. This is a class now. Yes, it is somewhere in the Bible. Every time you see the Bible, the word of God say, it is written. You better go find where it is written. Every time you read the word, it is written. Don't, don't, don't just keep going. Ask yourself, where is it written? So put a pen. Put a paper, whatever you do, mark where you were, don't, don't stop reading. But go back and look for where it is written. And God has blessed us, you can search. Thank God for Google. You can search anything out in a millisecond. Imagine when people had to bring the whole scroll to look for where it was written. That's what I'm going to do to keep the young people busy. I give them a whole scroll. Go look for where it is written. <laughs> but Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 says this. He humbled you and in your hunger he gave you manna to eat, which neither you nor your fathers had known, so that you might understand that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So Jesus knew about manna, even though it was in heaven, was the word, but he knew the sequence of events. He knew why the manna was provided. He knew what was provided. Most times we stop at what is happening. What happened? We don't know why it happened. We know food was provided, which is why the devil wanted Jesus to command stones in the wilderness to become food. But Jesus did not stop by saying, God can provide food. It says so that they can know, so that you might understand, which is the why behind the what. So that you might understand that man does not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Imagine Jesus was led by the spirit of God into the wilderness. Yet, the enemy is coming to tell him, if you are the son of God. Guys, look at the contrast here. The Holy Spirit tells you to fast. And then the enemy comes and says, you know, but God's grace is good enough. God says it's not by works that men should prevail. It says, (laughs) 
And you're like, oh, yeah, 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 I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm saved by grace, you know. <laughs> but God told you to fast. God told Jesus to go in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit drove him there. Yet, he was being tempted by the provision of God that is always a constant. Doesn't matter whether Jesus fasted or not, God's goodness is always a constant. It doesn't matter whether or not you are in poverty or in wealth. God's goodness is always a constant. Yet the enemy will come and ask you, if you are a child of God, why are you suffering? If you are a child of God, why don't you have gas money? If you are a child of God, why don't you have, why are you not living in a four-bedroom apartment? Or a four-bedroom house? And all of a sudden, it's making sense to you. So you know what, God? Oh, that's... <laughs> The enemy didn't stop there. The enemy said, okay, I, I get you, Jesus. In verse 6 it says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Again, watch this. For it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. He knew the whole passage. Yo, he will preach, he will recite the whole chapter for you. The enemy will ch- a whole book for you. It's, it's the best Bible scholar in the room. Or you all think because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know the word of God more than the devil? The Holy Spirit only makes that word come alive in you. But if we talk about text, content, the enemy has been here before all of us. And this is critical because some Christians are careless with their faith. The thing because they are smart and eloquent that they can defeat the enemy. You don't know this. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. This is where in Psalms 91 verse 10 to 12. Again, when you hear it's written, you have to go back and look for it. Where is it written? And we read in Psalms 91, it says, No evil will befall you. No plague will approach your tent. For I, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hand, with their hands, in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus looked at the devil and I'm like, Yo, you, you playing with me. You playing with me. Don't you know it's also written? Don't you know it is also written? Remember when God tells you to fast, an enemy comes with a word. I hope you will tell the enemy too. It is also written. But you wouldn't know what to tell him if you don't know what the word says. And Jesus says again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Bam, right? The enemy ain't playing. It's still all there. Says Jesus, the enemy came back to him and says, if you would Fall down and worship me. I will give to you all that you see. And Jesus looked at the devil and says, For it is written. For it is written. Not like the enemy, I don't feel like it today. For it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Do you feel like you're hearing the voice of God every time you hear scripture says? The Bible says, for it is written. Every time you hear that somebody comes to you and they know what they're going to tell you. They already know what they want to convince you of. And they say, I feel like God says. Or they say, you know, the Bible says... Some of us, when we hear the Bible says, it completely disarms us. Immediately, you, you drop everything. Oh, what did the Bible say? What did the Bible say? And so whatever comes after that, you just swallow it. Because the Bible says. And this is the trick of the devil. Watch the way the enemy tempted Adam and Eve. He didn't come and say, yo, I want you all to do this. What did he say? Did God say?
Did, did God say? Of course you know God said it. You weren't even in the business, but you heard. How did you hear? You everywhere. All up in our business. God wasn't talking to you, was talking to us. Yet you know the word, mother. <laughs> Professional busybody is what the devil is. So do you feel like every time you hear God said, the Bible says, Scripture says, do you automatically believe that that's God's word? I need you to, after we finish this, really study God's word for what it is. Because you will be the only person who can use God's word when the enemy comes against you. The enemy knows the word of God more than we do. It's not a matter of shame. You got to understand that the enemy knows it more than you do. But you got to know that you still got power that the enemy don't got. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why God says, Jesus says, I will send you the comforter. And the comforter will do what? It will remind you all things. It will teach you all things. You know why? Because I know the devil's smarter than you are. When you've forgotten about the word, the enemy will come and ask you, twist the word I, I told you. But scripture says the Holy Spirit will remind you all things, teach you all things, clarify all things. That's why without the Holy Spirit, you're a powerless Christian. You're bait in the hands of the enemy without the Holy Spirit. You must run to the word himself. The Logos himself, Jesus. Every time you hear doubt or every time you hear the voice of the enemy, every time you hear words that doesn't seem like God, run back to Jesus. Run back to the word himself. But how was Jesus able to handle the deception of the enemy? He studied the word of God. Where he talked about that. Jesus studied the word of God. So that he could handle the word of God correctly. And there are different ways to study God's word. And this whole series is really how to study God's word. And we want Christians to be mature enough, not just to, the, the, the verses you read in the week are the ones that you heard in church. It's to study God's word for yourself. To go back. Every scriptural passage you see here, you write it down. In addition to whatever else you do. Make sure that your, your pastor know what they're talking about. Make sure your pastor. <laughs> Not because I said it. Don't take it like that. Write it down. Go check it out. We have to make sure we are stewards of God's word ourselves. And there are different methods of studying the word of God. Right, we have the general, this is one of the most popular method, methods, it's called soap or soak. S-O-A-P or S-O-A-K. Soap, S means scripture. So find the scripture, read the scripture, really, really look at it. If you want to read a chapter, a verse, or, the, or an entire book. And then O is for observation. Observe the things happening in the, in the text. Don't rush to a conclusion, just observe the word of God. A is application. Somewhere in observation, there has to be interpretation because without interpretation, you cannot apply correctly. And so there is S, scripture, O, observation, A, application, and then P, prayer. Another version, the other version says soak. K is for kneeling down to pray. So essentially the equivalent, equivalent uh, um, acronyms for studying the word. And they're more complex ones. But this should serve a believer. It should serve a believer. It should serve you all. So let's, let's look at some other ways we can study the Word of God. You can study the Word of God with a, from a topical perspective, the topical, topical method, which means you take a topic and you study the Word of God based on that topic. Love, for instance. What does the Bible have to say about love? What does the Old Testament have to say about love? What does the New Testament have to say about love? You can take another issue like marriage. What is God's heart concerning marriage? Old Testament, New Testament, right? Um, you can take um, warfare. And look at it. You can take uh, um, um, food. How many of us have studied the word of God based on food? 
And that's why we eat the way we eat sometimes. Oh, you, nobody like that. See, God's word, being a believer, being a Christian, there are no aspects of your life that it should not touch. We think the word of God is just for those spiritual things that make us fuzzy. But when we go home, everything else is south side of it. No. In him, we live, we move, and have our being. Everything about your life should reflect Christ. The way you sit, the way you look, the way you talk. Are you everything? And it's a walk. It's a daily walk. You mature daily. The things I used to do two years ago, it wasn't a sin. I just don't do it anymore. I don't have, a, I don't have appetite for it. Nobody got time to watch TV. Sitting down there watching people, what are you all talking about? I mean, it ain't a pro- I just I got no time for it. Scripture says what? Keep account of your time. For the days are evil. So that's one level of maturity. You can find something else that, you know what? This doesn't benefit nobody. It doesn't benefit me spiritually. So you grow. So it's a daily walk. And that's what reading the word of God does to you. It matures you daily. It changes your appetite. It tweaks your appetite gradually. Gradually, you look back. People, people look at you and like, you're different. You, you're completely different. So there is the topical method, there is the biographical method. You take a person, a biblical character, and you study them in the Old and New Testament. It could be Jesus, it could be Abraham, it could be Paul, it could be Moses, it could be whatever. That's a biographical method. Then we have the devotional method. You take a text, you read it, you meditate upon it, you can check translations, concordance, and try to get exactly what it is and just let it soak into you. Spend time, devote your time to that text. You can do book by book study. You can do chapter by chapter method. You can do chapter summary methods. You can do verse by verse analysis. So you can do all these different types of study. But I want to give you one that is easy to remember. The five C's. Five C's of Bible study. How to study the word of God. It's easy to remember. If you remember the acronyms, you can just reproduce it. The first C, creep. First C, creep. It means when you see the passage you're reading, you make observation. You don't rush to make conclusions. You don't read into the verse what is not there. You slowly creep to it. You read the verses before it. You read the verses after it. You look at the summary of the chapter. If you can, you look at the introduction of the whole book. It gives you an understanding of what it is. You're creeping on to the verse. You're not jumping onto it and running with it. You're taking your time. That's one way to approach the text. The next thing you do is you have to be aware of context. Context. Context means the environment, the surroundings in which that scripture was released, that scripture was inspired. Some of the scripture, some of the traditions of the church today, which is rightfully so, good, I don't have a problem with it, but sometimes we, we fail to understand where our things have evolved. Some of what we do today, what we call doctrines of faith, were not presented to us based on, let me give you a doctrine of faith. It was presented by addressing a problem that happened in a particular time. Read the book of Corinthians, the letters. Most of that letter was either encouraging somebody to do what they need to be doing or correcting people from doing what they shouldn't be doing. And now we formed doctrinal positions with it. And that is why I look at people and I tell them, it is good that the Bible points you to Jesus, but don't ever, ever take the word of what you read in the Bible to be God himself. It's a revelation of God. It points to God. So the, 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 what, you, what, you should, what gives you faith? I have to be careful here because I'm sure some of you are like, I believe the Bible. I have 20, well, I have a lot of versions of the Bible in my house. I will read it until I die. But I want you to understand why you read the Bible. You are searching not for the letter. You are searching for the word himself. You are searching for the logos himself. You are searching for God himself. You are seeking. Somebody says seek is a better way than say search. 
because you know where it is. You were seeking for the word in the word. You're seeking for the word in the word. So ask yourself, what is the context here? Historically, what is happening here? Is this a time of war? Is this a time of slavery? Is this a time of famine? Is it a time of, of oh, did Jesus just pass? Was, what, what's going on here? You look at the, 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 the text, you, you should be able to tell things about the text that points to what was happening there historically, culturally. So you have to be aware of the historical context. You have to be aware about the literary context. What kind of book is this? Is this a law? The first five books of the Bible is considered the law, the Torah. It's an introduction to the nation of Israel, the history of Israel, how they became a nation, and the laws that guided them as a nation. The ceremonial laws and the different kinds of laws that they had to observe. And then when you move from there into the narratives, you move into the history, judges, kings, chronicles, you see a lot of bloodshed and war. And you're like, oh, is this? No, 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 this is just telling you about the dysfunction that people lived through. It's not saying that that's God's heart for warfare. It's not saying you should go kill somebody. It's telling you how people live dysfunctionally and how God's grace shone through all of that. And then you read the Psalms and you see a king whose heart is broken yet so contrite before God. And you see him vacillate between, vacillate between uh, um, worshiping God and, and being angry at his enemies. All of that shouldn't because I still see people pray a lot of imprecatory prayers today. And imprecatory prayers are prayers that are kind of sent back to the sender. You know back, back to the sender kind of prayer? Back to the sender kind of prayer. Oh, the psalmist David prayed it. Oh, yes, he prayed it. But he had a level of revelation when he prayed it. You have a better revelation now through Jesus. And Jesus told you that if your enemies strike you on one chin, you turn the other chin for them. If they take your, your coats, you give them your jacket. That's what Jesus says. So you got to understand the word himself. This is an example where you find, when you're finding conflict in studying the word of God and you feel like, which should I do? What should I do? Should I do this or should I do that? Look at Jesus himself. Look at the word himself. If you study the person of Christ, you know which one you do. What did Jesus do? What would Jesus do in my position? The enemy comes with a, with a temptation. Or, you know, you can do it this one time, you know. God's grace is good enough. It's, it's always present for us, you know. But ask yourself. What would Jesus do in this situation? Scripture says he was tempted in all ways yet without sin. So if the word can be without sin, I should be without sin. Now I understand there's a progress. There's a walk. But when you study the word of God, you study with the destination in mind. The word himself, the person of God himself is our destination. And that's what guides us in how we worship. So study the context. Creep on the word of God. Study the context. The next thing you need to do is find Christ in it. How does this point to Christ? In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, how does this point to Christ? You look at the story of Jacob. And Jacob being deceived and, and traveling from place to place. Where is Jesus in this? You can see that through the turmoil of Joseph, Jacob's life, and he went through and he married different, well, he married four women. I was just sharing with someone earlier today. But through that, through that, through the tribe of Judah, one of the sons of, J of Jacob, came the king, Jesus himself. You can trace it back if you want to. You're reading Ruth. Why, why, why is Ruth in the Bible? She's a Moabite, so like, why is she in the Bible? But if you, if you read well, you begin to see that she had no business in the lineage of Jesus. Yet, she came and became engrafted into God's plan. So you begin to see the storyline of God 
through all of the Bible. That's why you study the Bible. Find Christ in it. Then the next thing is the crooks. What is the core of this text? It could be a verse. What's the core of this verse? It could be a chapter. It could be a paragraph. What's the, what's the core of this? We know that the whole Bible is about the storyline of Jesus. And it tells us things we should do and things we shouldn't do. But when you take a particular text and you look at a paragraph, you should ask yourself, what does this paragraph tell me about Jesus? Does it tell me about the goodness of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the holiness of Jesus, the purity of Jesus, the long-suffering nature of Jesus, and the godliness of Jesus, the humility of Jesus? What about Jesus does this point me to? And then when you find the crooks, you must ask yourself the question, what should I do about what I know? There has to be a call. The call is what you do with the word you know. The call is, now I know what Jesus is saying. Now I know why Jesus did what he did. Now I know the word that points me to the word. But how does that come alive in my life? What do I do with this word? How do I apply it in my life? And by the way, do you all know that the more scripture you know, the more basis the enemy has to tempt you? You all didn't get that. The better you become at studying your word, the more difficult the kind of temptations you face. Because it's not a temptation to curse somebody out anymore. It is not a temptation to sleep around anymore. You already passed those challenges. It's the nuance of whether or not you are pleasing God with every second of your life. When it's not obvious to people around you that you are in sin or not in sin. That is, the, that is when the enemy begins to twist the word of God. So the more of the word of God you have in you, the more basis, the more the, the devil has tools to say, did you hear? Did you read in Daniel 4? <laughs> yesterday, just yesterday you were reading in Ezekiel. Do you remember that word? Or oh, last year your pastor was teaching on Matthew. Do you remember what Jude say? And John, do you remember it? You know why? Because now you have more word. So it is not enough for us as believers just to know the word. We have to know the person who is the word. We have to have a revelation of Jesus. We have to be sound in our faith in Jesus. It's not about memorizing texts. It's not about knowing how to preach. It is about understanding the personhood of the word. Who is Jesus himself. The Logos himself. So that when temptations arise, you can cast them down. You can cast down the high imaginations. Every thought against the knowledge of Christ in your life. You can pull it down by the word himself. By the word himself. I just believe the Holy Spirit wants to activate a new grace, a new level of grace for the study of the word of God. And God accommodates us. Sometimes as believers, we study one verse in a week, or, and that's good. And we, we, we drink milk. Apostle Paul said, it. you know, you're still uh, drinking milk like infants. Like grown-up people with, t- with you know, bot- bottles in their mouth. It's fine, you're surviving. It's not a problem. But my heart desires for you to grow up, to chew meat, to go into the deeper things of God. And I just pray and believe in God that God is going to set our hearts on fire here at this church. If you rise to your feet as we press in, I want us to really look at our lives and look at the challenges that we have in studying God's word. For some of us, we may have missed it. Honestly, we may have missed it. Going by what we thought God said, he said. When the enemy came, he said, God said this. Did you hear God say this? Did you hear Jesus say this? Do you hear the message of God? And sometimes we go based on incomplete word. And we do what it is that is not on the heart of God. And we mean well. But we've missed it entirely. And the sad thing is we didn't even know that we missed it. Because we went or we 
thus said the Lord. We went with the Bible says, the scripture says. So I, I want us to just, just almost retrieve our past. Because I know a number of us here, when we, we look at our lives, we ask ourselves, how did we get here? How can we come out of this? I know people say, God told me to do this. Oh, two years ago, God told me to do this, and now I'm in this fix. And yes, God speaks and people obey, but sometimes people get it completely wrong. And they're holding God accountable, and I'm like, are you sure God said that? Are you, are you sure God said that to you? So I want you guys to say it because the pastor cannot help you better than this. All the pastor can do is point to you to the fact that you got to get in your word. But you have to know the word enough and know where to run to when you don't know the word enough so that you can distinguish spirits. You can distinguish lies. You can tell what is God's word for your life and what isn't. You can distinguish prophetic words from God's word. So spend time. Just say, God, I, I, want, a, I want a fresh perspective of your word. 